Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. Here's your host, Chris Lee. Commodore fans, on your feet, it's time to anchor down. Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast, presented by Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. We're part of the 440 Sports Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Andrew Allegretta, he is the voice of Vanderbilt football. He is in Hawaii. He is helping us preview Saturday's matchup with Hawaii. And with that, straight to our interview with Andrew. Andrew Allegretta joins us from Hawaii, where he is, oh, just over a day out from calling the Commodores opener against Hawaii. He's been out there a few days, I think is now relatively adjusted to changes in time and all sorts of stuff. Andrew, thanks for joining us. How have you been? Uh, I'm great. I would say fully adjusted at this point. It is a strange adjustment, like you and I were just talking before we started. Uh, the first couple of days out here, your body will wake you up at 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning or whatever it is based on when you typically wake up back at home. So it's, it's, it's not a nothing time change. It is a very significant time change. So thankfully at this point, I feel fine. Well, there's adjusting to it as you and I, and there's adjusting to it as like a world-class athlete. So <laughs> how, how do the people it's, on it's the team yeah. do with it? Yeah, I, I'm curious as to how that's, they felt they've been impacted. I, I, feel like, I feel like it's a little bit the same thing. Like you can be a world-class athlete, but your body's going to still think it's, you know, five or six in the morning the first day or so. I mean, I do know the inverse talking to some Hawaii folks that – it's common for them to just say, don't adjust off of Hawaiian time, right? They go play Fresno State or whatever it is in the Mountain West, and they stay on Hawaiian time for everything, um, which, which almost strikes me as a little bit easier because if you've got a 7 o'clock kickoff in California, that's really like a 4 o'clock kickoff in Hawaii, so that's more manageable. It's twofold, right, because you want to come out here and give the guys an experience because who knows how often you'll come to Hawaii. But at the other side, you come out here to win a football game. And, and part of coming out early is to get these guys adjusted and ready and good to go come kickoff what will be 4.30 Hawaiian time. And, and I do think coming out on Sunday seems to have made a positive impact on that goal. Tim Corbin's favorite line in a spot like that is it's a business trip. Have you heard that one repeated out of the coaching staff? You know, I don't know that I've heard it from their mouth, but you can see it with how they're operating. Um, you know, they've got the big team banquet room set up and there's always guys in there doing something. Um, you know, some of the graduate assistants or quality control types are out at the pool, but they're doing so with their laptop watching film. Uh, so they're trying to split some hairs a little bit there, but there, there is a, there's a deep focus to get out of here with a victory. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a little different between what experience you give the players and the experience that you give the coaches. I mean, this is still Vanderbilt University. It is still about the growth holistically of the student athlete as a player and a person. So there is value beyond, hey, we're on vacation, let's go to Pearl Harbor. Like there's growth there. Uh, as someone that's done the Pearl Harbor thing a couple of times, there's personal growth there, which is of value. Uh, but these guys are working hard. They've practiced every single day. They've got meetings. Uh, their schedule is very meticulous. Uh, it, it is both designed to give them that experience of being here while also being very, very focused on football. I, I really just like, you know, I'm on that Teamworks app that has the schedule all laid up. And you can look at it. There, there, there is very specific and structured timing. This is not like a freewheeling thing here. Um, They've got these guys organized. Um, so I don't know that I've heard them verbatim say, this is a business trip and we don't care that we're in Hawaii. I think they're, they're doing what they can to recognize the fact that they're in Hawaii, try to experience. But, uh, you know, I, I'm on a little bit of a tangent here, Chris, but I do feel like one of the things that gets lost sometimes with Clark is people refer to him as this professorial Vanderbilt football coach. And that's great. Like the Vanderbilt football coach should be that. I mean, if you went into the lab and built a Vanderbilt football coach, Clark sort of comes out. Having said that, he's competitive, man. 
he's not here to just holistically build the student athlete. He's here to win football games. So yeah, he's designed this whole trip ultimately above all else to leave the Island on Saturday with a victory. So I, I he's super competitive, man. So I, I don't want any of that sort of stuff to get lost. It's like, it's not like, Oh, maybe we win, maybe we lose. I, they're, they're, they're here to win a football game. So they've designed, they've designed the schedule as such. All right, let's get the real hard hitting question for you out of the way. How okay. much are you looking forward to pronunciations on Saturday night? And I don't mean Austin Hopp and Leonard Lee. Or, uh, or Jordan Murray, their tight end. Right. Um, I mean, I'm not looking forward to it. I, I've got all of the pronunciations on my chart so I can get my way through it to the best of my ability. Um, I, I, try, I try not to be flippant with pronunciations because sometimes it's, it, it almost feels reductive. I mean, I get, I get the question, right, Chris? Like their, yeah. their pronunciation guide is like three pages long or whatever it is. Uh, I, I don't, I don't want to be dismissive or reductive to the way the names are pronounced, and I, I, I surely do my best. But, I, I, again, I did this trip once before, and uh, it's, I mean, it's an experience. But at the same time, some of their more notable players uh, – are not heavy lifting. Like I, that, that's sort of, I've kind of taken that away from doing as much game prep as possible with a team that's turned over like 50% of its roster. Uh, you know, their big tight end is Jordan Murray. They've got a handful of quarterbacks with fairly straightforward names. Whoever ends up being the starting quarterback, we'll find out uh, come Saturday evening. So I don't know, like I'm not, I'm not looking forward to it. I try to be respectful of it and, and good about it. Uh, but it's kind of a boring answer. I'm supposed to like tell you how ridiculous it is right. and all of that sort of stuff. Per- perhaps because I've done this uh, not forever in a day, but um, long enough that I've I've come across a handful of bizarre ones. What's difficult, honestly, like in all seriousness, like here's here's the I suppose pull the curtain back moment. The difficult ones are on special teams when you've got your spotter next to you and he's got a one through one hundred roster and he just points to the name and those aren't all fully. Um, phonetically spelled out and then you're like i got no chance and then it's a matter of like do i feel like saying who made the tackle or what (laughs) yeah and then you're trying to figure out in real time if you can sidestep it if you can't figure it out on the fly so like those are the not fun moments when it's just the quarterback or the running back or the linebacker that makes the tackle that kind of stuff is while challenging manageable it's like the random special teams play it's like i don't feel like making a goof out of myself here so you just sidestep it you could pull the Brent Musburger and just say that was a great play there by the linebacker. Well, yeah, oh, for sure. There's going to 100% be some of that. Like, oh, what a play by the cornerback for Hawaii. And then give yourself like a 10 count. And if you feel like you want to come back and get it, you can. If not, then we all just we all just move on to the next play. Hey, no, no judgment here. No, goodness. I appreciate that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about the bigger storylines you see for Saturday night on both sides. Well, man, um, is there one in particular that you had on the top of your head? Uh, I mean, there's a handful of storylines that I think I could, could go to. Well, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll give I, you I a little cheat sheet of mine and, and see what you think, okay? If you're okay. Vanderbilt... Yeah. One of the top things on my list would be quick starts because you know how big of an issue that was a year ago. And I think the other one would be just win the turnover turnover battle because, look, they're favored. Um, You know, the line was, I think, six and a half to start the week. I think it's maybe nine and a half or so I've heard today. So the expectation is increasingly they're going to win this game. Well, the best way to not win a game you're supposed to win is turnovers. So... On the Vandy side, those would be two at the top of my mind. I think those are both uh, certainly near the top in terms of getting out up here with a victory. In regards to the first one, I, I can tell you one of the messages, and I, and I just wrapped up my pregame conversation with Clark, so this is going to be on the air anyway. I'm not like, necessarily pulling the curtain back too, too much here, but one of the things that Clark has talked about with his team post-practice all week is this idea of, to confront or confrontation, understanding the fact that this team, albeit very new, uh, has a lot of pride. It's a prideful team because of who they are, where they're from, what they represent, what it means about this island. And then you add in, quite frankly, maybe the most significant 
football icon in Hawaiian lore now as your head football coach, maybe, right? Like you could throw a bunch of people in the mix, but Timmy Chang is, in terms of legends of the state of Hawaii, is way up there. You're going to get a prideful bunch, um, a group of fans that have not really been able to see Hawaiian football for a long time, in part because Aloha Stadium is a mess, in part because of COVID. But you're going to get I, I've seen all of this stuff online. It's not, it's 9,000 people. It's not Tuscaloosa. It's not Georgia. It's not Old Miss. I get it, but that's going to be a rowdy 9,000 people. So he wants them to confront the moment and try to deliver the first punch and then the second and the third. So he's mentioned that during practice. I think that is mindful for Clark. And, and I do think kind of, being tone setters is relevant in this football game that you still have to execute and then you've got to go from seven nothing to fourteen nothing to whatever and make the right play. So that that idea of confrontation is certainly there for Clark. Um, you know, I want to see how Mike Wright performs. Uh, he's going to be in the spotlight. There's no two ways around it. You've got a pretty healthy quarterback room between Mike and AJ and Ken. Uh, and he's going to have to make the right plays at the right time and, and be a better version of what he was a season ago. And he was a good quarterback. He ran the football. He put up the numbers against the two. He was positive against South Carolina, even though they did not get the victory. But he's got to be more than all of that. And he's got a longer leash to the point where he's not going to get yanked if it's not the world's greatest start on Saturday. Um, but – as, as you talk about with Corbin, I, I think Coach Lee has the same mindset. You rent your position. You don't own it. Uh, so he's got two pretty capable guys right behind him that are going to push him uh, throughout the course of the season. So I, it, not, to, not to go right to the quarterback and all of that kind of stuff because there's still 11 versus 11, but, but Mike's got a real big opportunity on Saturday to say, yeah, I am the starting quarterback, and you're, you're going to have to come take this job. I'm not – saying they're going to go full-on service academy, do you, but do you get the sense that they are going to be more run than pass? Because I do. Not necessarily. I think they're going to try to structure it in a way that is beneficial to Mike. Uh, and they've put a lot of work in to elevate Mike's game so he can be effective with his legs, Right. He's so obviously a running quarterback at this point. As, as much as he's grown as a passer, and I, I genuinely think he has grown as a passer during the offseason, right now, everybody's going to treat him like a running quarterback. But I do think they will, and I don't necessarily know what it looks like. This is just kind of from being around practice and just kind of talking to some folks. I don't know what it's going to look like. But I do think they're going to try to find ways for Mike to be successful within the passing game uh, to make sure that defense, defenses can't put eight people in the box and just attack Ray Davis and attack Mike Wright's leg. I don't know what that looks like. Mike can throw the ball down the field. Can you find a way to get Will Shepard in some one-on-ones and he wins jump balls? Can you, can you find a way to be effective with the short passing game? Whatever it is. Um, I, I, again, I don't know if they're going to go I, – I, I don't think they're going to go full service academy like Navy. Um, and start running the triple option. But, I mean, I, I, I think if that was in the mix, I, I wouldn't be surprised. But I, 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 don't, I don't think they're just going to concede uh, Mike's right arm. I think they're going to try to make that work for them. Well, I, I say I feel that they're going to go more run than pass. That just is a gut feeling based on what Mike's strengths are and having Ray Davis and a couple of guys behind Ray who can play also. But, I mean, it was funny. I feel like – If you charted all the scrimmage plays in fall camp, I feel like they probably did throw more than they ran. But having said that, fall camp is a time to see what, you know, here's all the plays we can put out there and what we, you know, let's see what these guys can do or not do. I figure they'll pare down the playbook to the things that work best. And I felt like just on the whole, they were probably a better running team than a throwing team when Mike played. I think if you were to sit back and say, who is the best individual player on this offense? It's hard to not go with Ray Davis. That's not pushing. Aside that's that's what I would push- say. Yes. Right. Right. It's not pushing aside Will Shepard or anything. It's Ray Davis is your best athlete. So 
as much as I talk about Mike Wright is going to have to blah, 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 blah. I'm looking for Mike in the offensive line to give the offense enough to allow some of the skill players that Vandy has to truly shine through. That's, that's sort of it to me. Like Ray Davis should try to finish this game against Hawaii somewhere between 100 and 150 yards rushing. You would, you would, and a couple of touchdowns maybe, right? Like that would be, that would be ideal. Uh, so can Mike and the offensive line contribute enough to take the pressure off of the schematics, right? So defenses can't just say, we shut down Ron Dave, Ray Davis and we're fine. Um, but, but, but back to your point, you're like, yes, I, I, would think, I, would, I would think that running the football, if they can establish that, keep that in the front of their mind, make that their quote unquote bread and butter, that would be, that would be a good thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, so yes, yes, because I think Ray Davis is their best overall offensive player and Mike's legs are his best attributes. Sure. You would think you lean run, uh, but, but I'm, I'm curious to see what can they do to take the pressure off everybody thinking that they're just going to run. This season of the Vandy sports podcast has been made possible by my friend, Dr. Jody Jones, DDS. When it comes to general or cosmetic dentistry services, Jody is the best in Nashville. Just check out his client list. It testifies to that. He sees movie stars, music stars, athletes, coaches, you name it. Jody is the dentist of choice for stars in Nashville, but he sees regular folks like you and I as well. What people love about Jody's office is the ambiance. It's relaxing. It's friendly. Someone described it to me as a tooth spa. Whether your needs are general or cosmetic, go see Jody today. Call him 615-270-2322. See him at 55 Music Square East, not far from downtown or the Vanderbilt campus. Jody is a former Vanderbilt football player and a huge Commodore booster, so go and talk Vandy sports with him while you're there. Go see Jody Jones today. Thank him for his support of this podcast because without it, this season would not be possible. Okay, let's talk about when Hawaii's got the ball for a minute, and then we'll talk about when no Vanderbilt's idea. got the ball. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's the short answer to what I was going to ask you because you look at the depth chart, okay, and they've got three quarterbacks. I would presume um, Schrager's the guy who's going to play, or I guess it's I Schager. Think so too. Um, yeah. because he, he, he's, I so too. yeah, I mean, y- Yellen backed up, um, Pickett at Pitt a year ago, but the, the line wasn't great. Cooper didn't do much at Washington state. Well, Shager led them to that victory last year against Fresno state when they were okay. 25 team, they had some injury issues. So, I, I mean, who knows what happened in fall camp, but based on past results, again, I always say this and I feel like I'm like some sort of financial broker, like past results aren't predictive of future <laughs> earnings. Uh, but based on everything you can pull, um, Shager certainly feels like that guy, considering he was here a season ago and he was productive in the moment that he was given an opportunity. So I, I, I would think so, but I don't know how he meshes with what you assume Timmy Chang wants to run, uh, which, you know, he comes out of that June Jones run and shoot stuff. I mean, he is, He is one of the best examples of being a tremendous, I don't mean to be reductive, but system quarterback. In fact, a record setting system quarterback. Uh, I don't know how Shager fits into that. I don't, I don't know that anybody does like this game from a Vanderbilt standpoint. I mean, you want to talk about themes and like it's, it's how quickly can you adjust? How quickly can you figure out what they're doing and then move your chess piece on, on the board. And that's both from a defensive standpoint, and it's from an offensive standpoint, they're going to have to do that fast. And they're going to have to do it within the first couple of series and make adjustments and not just wait till halftime. So I, I, I don't know. But they've, they've lost. I, I think they feel like the – you can talk about the, the run and shoot sort of stuff. But, I mean, probably like Hawaii says, let's take away uh, Ray Davis. Fanny's got to take away the running back that they've got. It's Pearson, correct? Yeah. Um, who was, is, who is, I guess, their second leading rusher from a season ago uh, before they dealt with fairly significant exodus. Uh, he's a pretty good player. Um, so shutting down the run game and, and kind of you know, keeping everything in front of them is probably the more simplistic way to get out of the gate for this one. Yeah, the two guys that I would be worried about just based on what's on paper 
or Dedrick Parson, their running back, who had about, goodness, uh, close to 900 Parson. combined. Yeah. Uh, Parson, yeah. I'm sorry, Parson. about 900 Parson. yards yeah. combined a year ago, 5.3 a carry. Jordan Murray uh, at Missouri State caught 351 yards worth of passes last year. They're, the receivers, though, they are what? Goodness, seven of them listed on the depth chart. They caught 30 balls total for, uh, goodness, 300-something, 400-something yards. Everybody you pull up had four catches for 40 yards. Yes. Like, it's seven seven dudes that caught five passes for 25 or something like that. Yeah, I mean, and even Murray, like, 351 receiving yards pops on paper compared to the rest of these guys. But, again, it was at, at Missouri State on a totally different circumstance. So... Now, now, I think you look at between Parson, they've got a left tackle in Manning, who's two-time All-Mountain West. Um, they've got a guard in Vanderpool on the other side, who was an honorable mention All-Mountain West. And then the other three guys just played a little bit here and there. I mean, I, I guess their strength maybe would be you know, running left or running over right guard, but it's just hard to tell based on what they've done in the past or, or maybe not done is a better way to put it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think that offensive line is one of those things that grabs your attention, too. I think I saw it in the notes, Chris, that they have the third most returning offensive line experience in the country with like 109 career starts combined, which is which is mind boggling considering how new the entire roster is. Uh, so, yeah, you would you would I guess I guess you would say uh, Parson running the football for them is the way that that they ease their way into this season with a first year head coach. I mean not not to be not to be <laughs> I don't know, whatever words you want to put on it, but the likelihood of this game getting sloppy at some point I think is fairly high. Uh Vanderbilt's making a long trip. They've got a a quote unquote new starting quarterback despite the fact that Mike played last year. They've returned some pieces but it's still a work in progress. And then Hawaii is completely new. Um, so people making mistakes and, and not letting your mistake beat you is probably uh, going to be a, a, a real factor in this ballgame too. Yeah, even the, the starting stat for the offensive line is almost a little misleading. I think that's mostly in two guys. Because yeah. their left yeah. guard played six games last year. All those were as a backup. Their right tackle played 13 games. It looks like that was mostly on special teams. And then their center started six games a year ago. So a lot of that experience is with really in two guys. For sure, right? I mean, this, this Hawaiian team is... It's been it's been one of the weirder experiences, frankly, Chris, to try to prep for this game uh, because normally you can go watch something, reference something, uh, have kind of a baseline. It's not only do you do you have a first year head coach and a ton of new players, the ones that you expect to play didn't really play that much last year. So um, it's I, I don't I. I don't. I have no idea. Like it's it's the, talking to you about this game is one of the weirder experiences. Like I, I've got, I've got no idea. Normally you can kind of pull some thematics and you're trying to. This one I just I feel like you're trying to decode, like a, I don't know. You, I just it feels like a decoding process here. Yeah, it, it's it's bizarre. I mean, and in defense it's no different. I think their top seven or eight tacklers, uh, it's at least the top seven are all gone from a year ago. And they, I, I mean, I don't know how much you've talked about it or written about it. Like, their offseason was hard. Um, it, it's mildly humorous with some of the details, but there was pain and strife uh, in the offseason with Todd Graham resigning and all of the players that, that hit the transfer portal. I mean, there was a true mass exodus out of this program. Uh, it, like it, the, the player backlash, the allegations were so significant that the state assembly literally held a hearing on what was going on with the UH football program, where you got some remarkable details like players claiming that uh, Todd Graham was belittling the ukulele, which feels like belittling the guitar in Nashville. Like, don't do that. Uh, 
or he, I think he allegedly claimed that Hawaii was a third world country because they didn't have Dr. Pepper in the vending machine. Like those are the humorous things, but that's ugly. Uh, and it led to a huge, like every, it, it's not just, oh, their top wide receiver graduated. Their top wide receiver left. Their top quarterback left. Top running back left. They all left. They all got out of here because the culture was so bad. They are, whatever you think of the rebuild for Vanderbilt from a season ago, going from Derek to Clark, and, and I don't think anyone was claiming that the football program was in a healthy place. Uh, Hawaii might have been in a worse place. Yeah. So it, 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 it's a, and I think there's enthusiasm because it's Timmy Chan. And there's enthusiasm because there's this attempt to bring back pride of being a Hawaiian football player. And, and Timmy Chang came from like the most prestigious high school on this island uh, in terms of football, St. Louis, which uh, produced Timmy Chang. It produced Marcus Mariota. It produced Tua Tagovailoa. It produced all of these players. There, there is pride in what they do. Putting on those helmets means something to this program right now, but that only means so much at the moment because of, of, of how much patchwork they're doing. So it's Hawaii is just, in terms of the actual game, they're going to come, they're going to come fired up. Like I, I genuinely believe there is going to be a bucket load of energy in that, you know, retrofitted track stadium. But there is so much newness that it strikes me as difficult for them to execute at a high level. I don't know that Vandy is going to execute in the way that Clark wants them to execute on every single snap. I'm sure they won't. But you talk about why the line has moved over the past couple of days toward Vandy, you, you would think it's because people are figuring out exactly how new Hawaii is. I'm, I'm sure Vandy will have its moments of whatever, but it just strikes me as really hard considering everything that Hawaii went through this offseason for them to execute at a high level. That doesn't mean they won't win the football game. They might. I just think some of the stuff is going to look clunky because it's going to be hard to be smooth and efficient based on everything they went. Are you ready for the mailbag? Sure. All right. Our mailbag is presented by Sutherland and Belk, a family-owned injury law firm. If you or a loved one has been hurt in an accident, please give Taylor or Russell a call. That number six one five eight four six sixty two hundred. See what your rights are and if they can help. Believe twenty two asks, "What is your biggest concern about the Hawaii game?" Biggest concern for the Hawaii game. It probably goes back to what I was just talking about. Um, it's not really, I think a lot of people would say, oh, the time change and uh, guys aren't focused because, you know, I'm staring at palm trees. Um, I, I think it's the unknown of Hawaii, which will give it and take it. Um, there is so little to go off of. Uh, there's a few small positives, um, like the offensive coordinator, Ian Shoemaker, is relatively good friends with A.J. Blazik, our offensive line coach, because of their roots through Division II football. So maybe A.J. can help kind of piece together what Shoemaker wants to do. Uh, but there is so much unknown that you want to get through the first couple of series without stumbling too much uh, and then being able to, to adjust quickly. Uh, if they can make reasonably quick adjustments, uh, I, I would hope the, the – the talent gap between the SEC and the Mountain West, and specifically what Hawaii is going through, will shine through. But the the unknown of what Hawaii is going to do gives me the most pause in this game. VUNGA asks, do you believe A.J. Swan will be the first quarterback off the bench if Mike Wright can't get it done on Saturday? Um, I don't think there will be a quarterback off the bench unless – Mike gets hurt. Uh, I don't. I don't know that there would be that sort of leash on Mike at this moment in time. Um, I think if you've been pretty declarative about Mike Wright as your starting quarterback, um, I think he's your guy for a little bit here. Now, if we get through the first couple of games against opponents like Hawaii, you know, Elon. Wake Forest is very good, but obviously their quarterback's out. Like, you could start to have that conversation maybe a month into the season. I, I don't think we're there with that conversation yet. But the depth chart if, if the depth chart would tell you that AJ is the first guy off the bench. And I don't think that's I, – I don't mean it disrespectfully. I don't mean it 
I, I just, I think AJ earned it. Guys. Like, you know, I, I don't think this is like, oh, AJ's the, <laughs> AJ's the freshman. You've got to keep him happy or whatever. Like I, AJ looks really good in practice. Um, I, I think um, not to deviate too much on you, Chris. I, I just, I think one of the great things about this freshman class is they've forced everybody into the best version of themselves, whether it's adding AJ to the quarterback room or Jada McGowan to the wide receiver room or Agu to the defensive end room, whatever it is. Like, I think they have forced people to be the best version of themselves. Like Ken Seals is a pretty good quarterback, but AJ's a, AJ's a really good quarterback. I'm sure he's not ready, ready as a freshman, uh, but he's good. Um, the depth chart would tell you AJ's first off the bench, but in, in this game, I think it would require an injury for that to happen. Okay, there's a lot of presumption in the question here. I'll let you tackle it as you see fit. Okay. Believe 22 says, why do you think we will win the Hawaii game? You know, one of my favorite uh, TV shows is The West Wing, and I always enjoy, I always enjoy those moments on the show where um, – CJ or the press secretary or whatever would remind people they don't have to accept the premise of the question. Uh, I, I mean, I, I accept the premise of this question that will win the Hawaii game. I, I, I think I, I've got no idea if we're going to win the Hawaii game. I've got no idea. Um, I, I just ultimately think the difference between year one for Timmy Chang and year two for Clark Lee will ultimately be the deciding factor here. Uh, and then, and then, you know, hopefully the talent gap between the SEC and the Mountain West. I, I just, I'm sure we'll go through Saturday and have our moments of head scratchers or a false start penalty that drives us nuts or Mike makes a bad read and throws a pick or something like that. I'm sure we'll have our moments. Um, I just, I think in totality, the, the separation between Clark building his program in year two and Timmy Chang trying to establish this thing in year one would be the reason that I'm confident going into this one. Denver Door asks, for a successful season, what are the one to two biggest things you want to see from the Hawaii game? Wow, from the Hawaii game. Um, I suppose we'll say you talk about the premise of the question. It depends on what your definition of a successful season is. Um, and we, I, I, I don't, I don't know how necessarily to answer that question in terms of like, if this happens in the Hawaii game, it should set the table for, um, uh, a successful season. Um, uh, I mean, if, if you're going to straight go to wins and losses as the only barometer for a successful season, which by the way, it's the most important barometer, but none of us are naive. Like there's, there's more to it for Vanderbilt at the moment. Um, I mean, you got to get out of here with a victory. You need to start off two and O to try to give your, yourself a chance, hopefully to go four and O through non-conference, but maybe split and go three and one. And then if you pick off an SEC game, whatever it is, now you're talking about clear and tangible growth. So, you know, from a, from a purely wins and loss standpoint, you've got to get out of here with a victory. And again, I'll keep saying it. I, I, through all of the prof- professorial narrative with Clark, I, it, it gets lost how much of a competitor he is and how, you know, deeply rooted on winning the football game he is. Um, and Candace Lee is, by the way, uh, did an interview with, with her and same things, right? I'm glad we've had the chance to be out here, give the guys the experience. And, you know, if you listen to the radio broadcast, she'll say it. She says, now it's time to win a football game. So, um, in the most simplistic sense, uh, what do you want to see out of this game for a successful season? You, you sure as heck need to get out of here with a victory. Woody VU66 asks, do you think this is a must-win game for Clark Lee, especially after the ETSU game last year? No, I don't. I don't, I don't really. And, and I understand, again, the root of the question, uh, both from like a logical and emotional standpoint. Um, I don't really bite on must-win stuff, except for like Game Seven, <laughs> you know, in the playoffs. Um, I, I, I think Clark, on like a grand scale, Clark needs some proof of concept points, whatever those look like. Um, 
I, I don't really bite on must win. Again, back to the previous question, to have a win and loss successful season getting out of here with a victory is pretty sizable. Um, so must win? No. Like, is Clark Lee a good or bad coach because of ETSU and whatever happens with Hawaii? I, I mean, I don't think so. I think Clark's a pretty darn good coach. Uh, but I don't, I don't fight on must win. But I, but I sure as heck recognize the significance of getting out of here with a victory on based on like just the schedule and how it lays out. Woody VU66 asks, do you think this offensive line is improved enough to be able to run the ball against the teams we should be able to run on? I think so. I don't know so. I don't know so with anything. Um, I, I get the sense that this offensive line has some clear strides that it has made. Uh, I know there's a lot of optimism about what Gunnar Hansen can do for this offensive line. There's optimism of what Rammer can add to this offensive line. There's optimism about some of the younger guys in that room and what they can do in the future for this offensive line. Um, but you're talking about right here, right now. And I, I think those are the, those are the unknowns, but I mean, to me, that's, I think I kind of said that already. Like, uh, I, I just, what I want to see out of the offense is the quote unquote complementary pieces doing enough to truly let some of our high skill set players shine through. Like, I think Mike's a very, very talented quarterback. I'm not being reductive of Mike, but if we all sat back on paper and said, who's your best couple of athletes on offense, you're going to go Ray Davis, Will Shepard, boy, Jaden McGowan looks good, or we'll see what, you know, Patrick Chief Smith can do and all this kind of stuff. But that requires Mike being efficient and the offensive line being efficient to allow that skill set to shine through. So I don't know. I, I think I want to I want to see in this Hawaii game some of those things come to fruition so you do feel like the skill set players can be at their best. All right, just a few more, and they're all easier from here. Uh, Go mm. Doors 94 says, when's the team flying back? Are you traveling with the team, and when do classes start? Uh, I don't know the class to start. I think if, they, if my Twitter feed is to be true, I feel like I saw some stuff where Chancellor Deermeyer um, was at classes the other day. So I feel like they've they've just gotten started. Uh, yes, I flew with the team. Uh, again, we got here on Sunday. We fly back right after. The game. So they're effectively doing a red eye back uh, to get the team. I think our, our itinerary says get back on campus about 2 o'clock Central Time. Ooh. Um, uh, not a.m. p.m. Two, Either two way, p.m. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be rugged. Two two a.m. almost would be easier because that would be what nine o'clock Central Time or Hawaiian Time. Um, what was the last one? Am I trying? Uh, I feel like I did. I hit all of them. I feel like I, I think, hit all of them. I think you did. I'm yeah, with, I'm, I'm I'm traveling with the team. We get back after a red eye Sunday afternoon. I will say this. I'll throw this in. Here's, here's a nugget for you. My understanding is Chancellor Deermeyer will be here for this game uh, in person in Hawaii. That's my understanding. Um, I don't want to go all Malcolm Gladwell, or not Malcolm Gladwell, um, uh, uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Uh, 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 Mitch Album. Mitch Album, yeah. Who, Mitch Album, yeah, who, who wrote that somebody was in attendance when they only planned to be and ultimately didn't show up. But my understanding is Deermeyer's coming out here. So I, I, hey, no, I'm not... I know I'm the company man or whatever, but uh, I'm, I'm just I'm, all of this. Like, is it actually is there actually buy-in? Is there actually synergy between chancellor, athletic director, and, and football coach? And our chancellor is flying ten hours across the Pacific to be here for a football game. I mean, there's there is real synergy here. Um, so that's that's encouraging. Pedor wants to know your favorite Vanderbilt football tradition. My favorite Vanderbilt football tradition. Um, listening to Norm Jordan talk. Does that count? <laughs> sure, sure. Can I to do to that? be fair, there's not a lot of traditions around this program. I, That's not an easy. I, I, I didn't mean to be reductive. Like I, I'm aware of some things, uh, but I, and I, I actually think this matters to some of the people internally with marketing these days. 
it's hard to create tradition out of thin air. Like it has to be genuine and organic. But I think they're mindful of the fact that they don't necessarily have kind of that it thing to go through. I know we do the anchor drop, and some of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean, I don't, and again, I come from a place like Virginia Tech that has Enter Sandman and then Tulane had the, the hullabaloo, which they sing after every touchdown. So I don't, I don't know that there's a calling. Am I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be the new guy here, but is there a calling card? I mean, the closest they've come to it is the Star Walk and yeah, Vandyville, Walk, and those Walk. are all really last 15 year developments, I think. I mean, there's the foghorn yeah. after a touchdown and those kind of things, okay, but there's yeah, just yeah, not yeah, a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and to be yeah. fair too, like COVID has sort of disrupted a lot of those things the last couple of years and you just got here. So. Well, I, I appreciate the forgiveness there. I, um, I mean, I, I don't know. And, and some of it too is just, it's born out of repetitive victories, um, which we need more of. All right. Last one. And I had to look what this up, what this even was. Um, baseball bros wants to know, were you a member of Otto's army while at Syracuse? Uh, no, I do know what it is. Uh, that's like the student section. That's yeah. the, I, I mean, I actually, I probably was right. Like as a freshman, I probably sat in Otto's army and don't really remember it. I do think I've got it like a, a ratty t-shirt from back in the day. Uh, so I was in it, um, from a, you know, I only spent so many games in the Carrier Dome as a fan, Chris, because quickly us broadcasting knuckleheads um, drift off to the student stations and we're in the studio or we're calling the games. So I only had um, I only had a couple of years as a true fan fan. Um, I remember storming the court with a victory over Georgetown, I believe. Uh, so that was fun. So I had a few moments here there. Who was Otto? Otto Otto's the mascot. Oh, the okay, got you. I I should know these uh, things. Which, yeah, I mean I, I mean there's there's they used to be like the Saltine Warriors a long time ago, and then they went to the Orange Men, obviously, and then you know we drift just to Orange, and so it's I mean I, I suspect most of your podcast listeners recognize it, but for some of the people that don't, it's not it's not like they decided to be a fruit as their <laughs> we're not just a fruit. We're not just a color. Um, it it was it was more rooted in the Native American traditions of that region, of which it's really hot, which is part of the reason why Syracuse lacrosse is really good. All right, I'm out of questions. Uh, thanks for joining us. Any parting thoughts, uh, announcements for the broadcast, anything that are of interest to the listening audience out there? Uh, sure, I'll keep plugging this. Um, two things. One. Um, you'll find us 93.3 in Nashville. Plus, there's a new app design that has gone public within the past week or so. I think finding our broadcast streaming through the app is very easy. Um, I tried to make it as easy as possible when I was involved in those conversations. When you uh, update your app or re-download the app, the Vanderbilt Athletics app, on the bottom bar, there's a button that says Live Audio. Hit it, hit football, that's it. That's all I got to do. Um, and then the other thing, I'll keep plugging it because, again, as you and I have talked, I've had fun with this. Um, we've got a good collection of, like, current Nashville-based music that will kind of be the soundtrack for our broadcast for the whole season. Um, I've been really lucky to get, um, you know, so I've, I've got a good mix. I've got a good mix of um, kind of people that are involved in, more of the true Nashville music business cycle. This guy named Phil Moore is part of Curb Records. And, um, he's kind of, his one of his songs is kind of going to be like the theme. It, you know, like you watch ESPN and they've got that Young Blood song is their, I think it's like Emperor or something like that is the theme of their college football promos, that sort of stuff. Uh, so this guy named Fillmore, King Calloway, who's actually, we're recording this on August 26th. King Calloway is performing at the Opry tonight. Um, and then it kind of goes down. One, one fun story, um, one of the songs you'll hear on our broadcast is this guy named Mike Dunbar. And I only stumbled upon him because I, I saw him performing at the Nashville Zoo. 
And he was super nice to my son who was there. Like he was interacting with my son and, you know, he had all of his information. I was like, well, shoot, you were super nice to my son. You've got a couple of songs. I'm going to see if you would let us use your song on our football broadcast. So we've got a, we've got a good collection. Um, Fillmore King Calloway, this guy named PJ uh, Solar, who's written number one hits for, um, uh, he wrote one of Morgan Wall. He wrote Up Down by Morgan Wallen. Um, He's written songs for Jason Aldean and, and others. Um, Jamison Rogers is another one he wrote for. And then Will Overman is a guy I've gotten to know. So it's a long rambling answer. Uh, Chris, you know my affinity for music and kind of incorporating that into the broadcast. So I'm, I'm really pleased with the, the people that we've put together. So for your listeners, um, you know, do those guys a solid. Go check out their stuff. Hey, thank you for your time. And my wish for you is you do not have to pronounce the name Tamatoa Moki Al Ati Malala. I think that's it, according to the pronunciation that, guide here. Is that, the, is that a defensive lineman? Uh, he is the third guy in one of the wide receiver spots. He's in or with gotcha. Dior Scott, and I'm hoping for your sake, Dior Scott is the guy who's the the first man off the bench in that rotation. I actually think he is, because I know Dior Scott. I've looked up his... He was on uh, Last Chance U for folks that watched. Oh that yeah, episode. yeah, yeah, that guy. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. thank you for your time, <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll Chris, see you I'm next. Going to the beach. Me and Norm are going to the. What time is it? Uh, yeah, I got about an hour down at the beach before we leave for practice. So well, we'll, we'll see next. you. We'll see you next week when the pronunciations for Elon might be um, a little manageable. more manageable without without consulting a chart. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good trip, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We thank our presenting sponsor, Jody Jones DDS. We thank our other sponsors, Sutherland and Belk and MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're interested in sponsoring this podcast, and that's how we make this work, please email me at chrislee70 at gmail.com. We also ask that you subscribe to our website, VandySports.com. That is $99 a year. You get things there that you don't get here. And, of course, please rate, review, and subscribe where you see our podcast. That helps us get noticed. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at VandySports.com. Follow me at ChrisLee70. And finally, subscribe to our Vandy Sports YouTube channel as well. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast, which is part of the 440 Network. I'm your host, Chris Lee. We'll catch you with another episode coming very soon.